Uh, okay, now let's come on to the real biggies, the eights. Uh, Taupo, I think I've mentioned this in my earlier talks, though I haven't really focused on this particular eruption. So Lake Taupo itself is the volcanic crater lake that resulted from this eruption 26,000 years ago. Before that, the biggest one was one, I'll go to the bottom right hand corner here, on the island of Sumatra called Lake Toba. Just to give you an idea of, uh, I guess, relative size and volume of the material from the volcanoes, uh, Mount St. Helens, one cubic kilometre, Krakatoa, there is 10, Tambora, 100. The one, I haven't got a picture, but just at the bottom of the writing there, uh, Taupo, uh, just over 1,000 cubic kilometres, and then Toba, they estimate at nearly 3,000 cubic kilometers of material. So, um, I guess the other one that uh, people in the US, particularly in the US, should be maybe not worried about, but just maybe bear in mind, because certainly present estimates suggest that it, uh, nothing major is likely to happen in the foreseeable future, and, and let's hope they're right. Uh, just as a matter of interest, the, that little sort of yellow worm is the ash that came from Mount St. Helens after it erupted. The large sort of pink lilac colour there through a lot of uh, central USA is the ash that would have come out from the supervolcano eruption from uh, Yellowstone, or the, the two of them. Uh, what, just over half a million and two million years ago. Okay, that's uh, a few minutes to go. Thank you, dear. Um, in terms of, I guess, the, the nasties that come out from volcanoes, uh, I've mentioned about the, the ash and the ash fall. Um, they have this thing called the Haas, which actually uh, derived from uh, it's a, uh, a Javanese word, sort of meaning uh, like a mud flow, very fluid flow. Uh, last slide, we had that one on uh, Mount St. Helens. But to me, the, the really scary ones are the pyroclastic flows. And I've got just a, a little video of one from Japan from a few years ago of a, a pyroclastic flow. finish off by looking at those, the last few um, examples of uh, what I call geohazards, maybe not as uh, destructive as some of the ones we've just seen, but still nonetheless important. I guess the first one, landslides. We get them throughout the world, different environments, uh, different conditions, usually not too destructive, but still can have, uh, you know, fairly severe impacts on uh, communities and in small areas. Uh, another one of sinkholes, are any Floridians here? 
Yes, a few. You probably know more about sinkholes than I do. Um, it was interesting, I haven't had time to show it, but it was a, a nice little video of after, what was your hurricane? You remember the last one that came through? And, and you know, because of all the water, all the rain, um, there was a lot of houses, unfortunately, that sort of ended up like that one, you know, teetering on the edge of the sinkhole. So, um, the last two I look at, uh, coastal erosion, and something in Australia I think we're, we're pretty terrible at. Um, people who build on essentially the back beaches, the back dunes, and then are surprised when the house falls into the sea. And also people who build on, uh, you know, they put a road through the cliff here, and the cliff's obviously, uh, you know, just normal erosion, and oh, what a surprise, uh, it's all fallen into the sea. Um, and then finally the last one, again, I think Australia is really bad at, is that we build on floodplains. And uh, people here from Brisbane? Yes. yes, a couple, okay. I'm sorry, but I have to use Brisbane as an example. They had, um, <laughs> uh, they are from bad flooding in the 1890s. Going back to the 1890s with bad flooding in Brisbane, they knew where the water level in the Brisbane River came up to. But they ignored it, built houses on the flood plains when so the floods in the 1970s. Oh, surprise, uh, all these houses got flooded. Still, they built on the flood plain. And um, much to my, since I've worked in museums, that sign there, don't worry about the little bits of writing, but the 2011 flood, there's a flood line, that's actually outside the Queensland Museum on South Bank in Brisbane. And then the writing tells you all the places that got flooded in the museum. That is a new museum. Now, why on earth they would build it on the flat plane? Then no, again, you know, we do a lot today, you know. Uh, but I guess that's the point I want to make. That if some of the people who, who plan things actually look at the geological record, consult with people who may know just a little bit about it, they build things elsewhere. So, anyway. That's the end of the show. They're my conclusions about uh, you know, what I, I think is important, how important the geological record is. And uh, look, I'm convinced Shelton's wrong. And, uh, oh, gee, I didn't mention the Kardashians, but I won't. Anyway, uh, I'm on again for the next three days. The next two are all about uh, geological. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now that our king and mermaids are present, what we're going to do is we're going to ask four guests at a time. Our pirates will assist in uh, the flow. So pirates, basically all the guests who are standing around the pool area here have signed up in the inner pool area. We'll do two from the left, two from the right, so that there's four people at each point in the pool. You're going to swim the equator for us, you're going to get here to the front, make your way up the stairs, and kiss this beautiful fish. Okay? And uh, please make sure that you smile for the photographer to get that uh, picture. And then, as I mentioned, two our participants, your certificates will be sent to your rooms uh, after the event. So, our participants, pilots, please get ready. Let's start swimming the equator. We'll take four at a time. Make your way across and come up here to the beautiful fish. Out here 
You come and kiss the fish. Kiss the fish. Put four and a half in your hands and you go from one side of the pool to the next. That's how you cross the equator. You come out here where I am, make your way to the beautiful fish. <laughs>
Thank you. In a similar situation as myself, he's also born of Ukrainian parents. Uh, we grew up in Ukrainian families, um, everything, you know, our church was Ukrainian, our schools were Ukrainian. And um, when uh, we, uh, we lived in New York for 15 years, and at one point we decided that it was time for us to move to Ukraine. Um, we had built up a lot of experience and we saw the challenges that there were in Ukraine. At the time we made our decision, Yanukovych was still president. Mm. And we just happened to move to Ukraine right at the time that that the Euromaidan revolution was starting. We actually came on the day that the students were beaten up on the Euromaidan, and uh, from that moment forward, we were involved for three months in the revolution. You um, actually trained, I believe, frontline uh, soldiers on first aid for a while. After the uh, uh, revolution of dignity, when the war started, when uh, the Russian the Federation, East, where, where when the Russian the Federation first uh, occupied and illegally annexed Crimea, and then uh, the army came into, the Russian army came into eastern Ukraine, um, there was a, uh, not a very strong Ukrainian military at that time. It had been uh, deconstructed over very many years. So uh, when we wanted to help the soldiers in a humanitarian program, um, we asked the soldiers what they needed, and they said they didn't have any first aid kits. So um, I, being a physician, went and asked my colleagues who worked for the military and asked them what do they do. They showed us this uh, improved first aid kit that used, uh, the U.S. And, and British military use, and when we brought it into Ukraine and, and showed, uh, showed it to the soldiers, they didn't know what to do with it, and what we found out was it wasn't the kit, it was the training that was more important. So our organization named Patriot Defense trained uh, 30,000 soldiers, um, cadets also in military academies, and we were able to um, give them about 25,000 first aid kits. So, so, so you described how those forces and, and the Ukrainian military had been hollowed out in many ways before that war and obviously things have changed since but it isn't obviously just the military where there is profound structural problems and now that you are health minister and goodness knows it's a meteoric rise uh, you're health minister and you seem to see the most terrible problems in the healthcare system I'm quoting you from 2017 describing a visit you made to a, uh, a child cancer ward in a hospital where you described mold on all of the walls no doctors showing any respect to the kids who were patients who could barely walk and the head doctors making money off desperate parents. What a terrible indictment of the healthcare system. Uh, one of the things that I'm admired for in Ukraine is that I'm honest and I tell the truth and I call things by their names. Uh, most Ukrainians agree that this is the way the health care system looks. Uh, for 26 years of independence, that's what was done. Uh, Ukraine inherited the legacy of the uh, Soviet occupation, the system that was in place, and nothing much was done in the health care system. Everyone was pretty much afraid to touch it, and there is a great amount of corruption in that system itself. Uh, well, you, you need to lead a system where you seem to be suggesting that, that a very significant, if not a, a, an overwhelming number of the doctors at the heart of the system are utterly corrupt. If we don't uh, face the problem, we'll never be able to solve the problem. But is that what you are saying? I'm saying that there is a big problem in Ukraine with corruption, whether it's on the level of the doctors, they make very low salaries, and they receive uh, what they call yeah. gifts from yeah. patients, yeah. which is cash payment under the table. Yeah. In, yeah. The in the world, that would be called corruption. Yeah. Uh, this goes all the way up to the top levels, where yeah. the heads yeah. of yeah. Yeah. companies yeah. make deals with each other during tendering processes, so that we pay far more for the medicines than we should be paying, and the chain from the bottom all the way to the the top there are a lot of problems along the way so what we're trying to do what we're doing with the new health care system is we're creating a system where there no longer is corruption that's necessary the doctors yeah. will be making a decent salary working in decent conditions and they won't need to have those extra payments given to them but to deliver that change you've got to take the doctors with you and it seems to me many of them aren't going with you at all just to quote one the heart surgeon and he's highly respected for his work in ukraine and many of his patients seem to be on his side boris oh, accused you 
of ministerial negligence. He says, your approach to the healthcare system in Ukraine has led to the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of patients. This is an example of um, the uh, fake news, yeah. fake narrative that comes out uh, from those people who are against the health care reforms. Uh, this particular yeah, doctor... He's an actual heart surgeon, isn't he? Yes, he is, and this particular doctor has been making a lot of money on the like placing stents in patients. What we do is we have national procurement of medicines and some of our medical devices. Um, when he was in charge of buying those stents, we were able to afford only 10,000 stents and a certain amount of money. In 2015, the parliament uh, voted for a law where we handed over procurement to international organizations such as Crown Agents. And for the same amount of money that he was able to buy 10,000 uh, stents, we've now been able to buy 20,000 well, stents be fair to because him, of he's the He's not here to respond to, to that particular may, may that charge of yours. Well, I mean, he just says, look at my record, look at the patients whose lives I've saved, who's, who seem to be on my side in this argument about where the healthcare system should be going. And he also points to other doctors. I can point you to but prominent uh, neurosurgeon, uh, Andre, uh, of course, Fitlana yeah, Donsker yeah. from the leading children's hospital. They all say that your radical and some the of the reforms of the Ukrainian healthcare system are simply misguided. Well, I think that what we can look at is a different side to this. Um, in the last three weeks, we started the program for patients to sign up with their family care right. doctors. Yeah. It's a, a change for them because until now, patients were told where to go to the doctor and which, which doctor they were supposed to see based on their geographic location. In the last three weeks, 1.3 million patients have signed up with their doctors. That's a huge amount of uh, support for the change that's happening. There are over 18,000 doctors that have signed up into the system. There's also uh, 1,200 medical facilities, uh, the primary care facilities that are going along with this. So if we look at the real numbers, we see that the people of Ukraine, and actually most of the doctors of Ukraine, uh, agree with this. Um, when I was flying here, I was uh, at Borispi Airport in Kyiv, and I was sitting having a coffee before Kiev, my flight, Kiev, and a, 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 um, a gentleman walked up to me, and he came up and he shake my hand, and he said, I'm from Dnipropetrovsk. I'm a family doctor. I've practiced for 40 years. Thank you for changing the system because finally I feel that I'll be able to do for my patients what I've wanted to do for them for many years. But um, it's a form of shock therapy for the system because you really want to radically overhaul it, make it patient driven, uh, make doctors have a different sort of payment system which is based on how many patients they have in their practice, which you say will encourage them to be better doctors. Uh, but is the system ready? There's one report from uh, the Ukrainian media describing how in Odessa your push to make all of this a sort of easy system with digital healthcare is running up against the fact that in many clinics they don't have an internet connection. That's one of the requirements to be in the new healthcare system is to have uh, internet and to have a uh, uh, computer so that the patients can sign up. Can you overcome the inertia, the vested interests that there are in the system as it currently stands, the, the status quo which you described so, so descriptively as failing, in your view, the people of Ukraine? And I ask the question because one of the leading critics of what you're doing is actually from the president, President Poroshenko's own party, and is also a qualified doctor herself, that is Olga Bohomolets. Now she has said that she thinks your reforms are disastrous, they'll lead to the closure of hospitals, the reduction in the number of doctors, and the, in her words, disappearance of rural medicine. And she's an ally of the president. Let's uh, step back a bit and remember what the history was when the NHS was created in 1948. Um, at that time, uh, there was a, a disaster in the medical system. People were paying for everything out of pocket. And when um, Knight Levis came in and said, we're going to create the NHS, we're going to create a new system yeah, where people will have I mean, a, a history of lesson about what happened in Britain after the Second World War with the creation of the National Health Service isn't really going to convince people in Ukraine in 2018 that your system and your radical reforms and your shock therapy are suited to their needs. Actually, there is a comparison here because when uh, 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 when it was started, um, 
uh, he was called Dr. Death. He, he was called Dr. Death by, he was called by the a, Ukrainian healthcare union. He was called recently. a medical fuhrer. Uh, the doctor said it would never work. It was the end of the medical system. And uh, 70 years later, the NHS is actually one of the most successful medical systems in the world. It's the same. When there are changes happening, those that are um, uh, those that are against those changes because they're comfortable in the system that is. Uh, for them, they're making a lot of money. Uh, for them, uh, they're comfortable in um, knowing what the rules are because they make the rules. Instead, what we're doing is pulling back and we're saying there should be equal rules for everyone and that each patient should have equal access to the quality health care that they don't Do have at this point. This is very important, not just in the sector of health care, but to the whole sort of uh, raft of reforms that P President Poroshenko claims to be determined to push through to transform and modernize Ukraine. Do you think President Poroshenko has got your back? Uh. I have the support of both the President and the Prime Minister. It has been from the very beginning. Um, when the uh, law was being passed in Parliament, actually the Parliamentary Committee on Health Care uh, supported the law. It was uh, the working group went through the entire law and presented